Hello and a very warm welcome to this episode of Passions. And today I'm delighted that my guest is a gentleman by the name of Paul Stainton. So Paul, thanks very much for your time and a very warm welcome to Passions. Tell us what your passion is and a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I, I suppose, thanks for having me, by the way, Phil. Uh, I suppose, my, thinking about it, my passion really, um, despite all my sort of broadcasting history and um, DJing history back in, in my younger years, I suppose my passion, my overriding passion when I think about it, is for showing off. Uh, I think, you know, I go back all the way back to school and, uh, you know, I was, I was the kid at the back of the class. I was the kid outside of the class a lot of the time. Um, but it was, it was always about, you know, making people smile, making people laugh, showing off um, in, in any way I could. And I, I think back of, you know, throughout the thing, the very many things I've done in my life from um, working on a stage and comparing summer shows in Bridlington to, um, you know, DJing in nightclubs and acid house parties in the 80s and early days of independent radio, BBC local radio, um, as a TV sports correspondent, you know, it's all about me showing off, really. <laughs> Just trying to, you know, uh, get in front of a, an audience in, in any way, shape or form. And I, I don't know where that comes from, really, because... You know, my dad was a bit of a singer, but apart from that, you know, my family doesn't really have that sort of background in entertainment. But um, as a young lad from Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, you know, showing off is is probably <laughs> what my passion is. And I, and I think that's really candid of you, actually, to, to say that. And as I was saying to you before we came on air, uh, I've had so many different conversations as part of this passion's journey. And that's a that is a new one, but it's a really good one. And one of the things I was going to say, because when you said that, what made me think is I've said to a few guests who've been on about how sometimes um, our, our natural performing nature is suppressed at school. You know, the classic is, isn't it? The classic is stop showing off to your friends. Mm, mm. Um, now, that's it. what's interesting for me is that you obviously kind of, if you to put it directly, almost like put two fingers up at that feedback. <laughs> Well, the thing is, I made my, a career out of it. Yeah, I mean, my my school years um, were I enjoyed them immensely. Not so much school, but I enjoyed being at school just to mess about and show off. And uh, because my dad worked in the pits uh, in South Yorkshire, we moved around a lot. I think I had something like twelve schools uh, before I left school. So because you were constantly having to to make new friends and meet new people, uh, I suppose I resorted to humour and mucking about to ingratiate myself and make new friends so i was always the class clown i was always the guy that made people laugh and or tried to uh, and i was always the guy getting you know picked up by the bit of hair at the side of your ear by the teacher you know and, and i remember that well or getting a slap when teachers could slap you you know uh, so yeah I, I i i saw my i i really enjoyed going to school just for the crack uh, and the piggyback fighting at lunchtime, obviously, on the school field. So uh, that, that sort of carried me through. And uh, I look back at my school days with, despite the, the mul myriad of schools I went to, I look back at my school days with, um, with much fondness, really. And, and then was there any design in the process of your career and the development of your career? Or was it completely ad hoc? I mean, there is obviously there's that theme of performing or showing off probably yeah. throughout. And as you've mentioned, obviously, BBC and DJing and everything. But was there any design in it or was it really total 100 percent accident? Have no, because my, my, my dad was really old fashioned. He was the son of an Irish navvy. I mean, his dad came to to the UK from Ireland to dig the air and colder canal in Gaul. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine, I mean, my dad's dad had a belt above his fireplace for his wife. Do you know what I mean? He was that sort of yeah, you know, Irish, yeah. Irish upbringing. Yeah, so my, my dad said to me, you know, if you want to keep living in this house when you're 16, you go get a job. So um, I was forced to go and get a job I didn't want to do. So um, I had a couple of O-levels, you know, most of the work I did at home because I didn't want to do it in front of my mates at school. So I, I think I did a, a whole English 16 plus at home and handed it in the week before I left. Uh, so I, I, in, a, in a way I was lucky because at the time in the, in the uh, sort of 84, 85, you know, I, I think you re probably remember that there was lots of adverts about, you know, three million unemployed, YTS schemes. But I got a job at British Aerospace, 
which I absolutely hated. Uh, hated it, hated getting up for it. Uh, and I, I think I used all my holiday in the first six months because I just was continually late for the bus. Uh, I just hated standing there banging bits of tin with a hammer. And I remember looking around thinking, how do I get out of here? How do I get out of this? And I remember saying to some of the guys on the tinner's balcony, oh, I'm, I'm going to be on the radio one day. And they, they obviously used to um, laugh at that. And, uh, think, yeah. and I used to think to myself, how am I getting from here to where I want to be? Because I always loved music. Music's always been a big part of my life. And I, 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 even as a kid, I could listen to music and think that's going to be a hit. And invariably it was. And I'm not being big-headed about it. That's, that's how I listen to music. I think, oh, it's catchy. It's got a good hook, good chorus. So uh, somehow I got from that tinner's balcony at Brough near Hull um and i got into um the stage in bridlington and uh i, I think i'm trying to think of the journey now I, I in the end um somehow my granddad uh intervened because he knew alan Happo was in this job and he he lent me some money to buy a taxi in bridlington and from that i met a man who did mobile discos so i started doing mobile discos and um then I was doing a bit of hospital radio on the weekend. And then from all of that, I started doing it's long and laborious, a, a gig at a, a, a summer nightclub in Bridlington, entertaining kids, so a kids entertainer. And, and then they were opening a new leisure centre and they said, would you like to come and work here? I've seen what you've done with the kids. Could you come and compare our summer show? So, you know, in, in the sort of six months from leaving British Aerospace, I was, I was 49 consecutive nights comparing a summer show in Bridlington at 18 years of age with very little experience apart from the showing off at school uh, and and a bit of a bit of DJ with kids so it, it, that that was the the sort of start of my journey into broadcasting if you like through through that yeah and was there a moment at all at that time I mean at 18 we're not really thinking about much other than perhaps girls and alcohol mm, perhaps. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and um, was there even any a moment at that even in those early days where you thought, oh, this is it. Thank God I'm away from what I was doing and I'm loving this. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember yeah. the day, I remember the day that I I told my dad I'd quit uh, and he chased me around the garden with a lump of wood. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, but, you know, I was so happy. And I remember walking onto that stage at Leisure World in Bridlington. It was a brand new complex then. I'm so old, they've knocked it down and rebuilt it. Uh, but they, I remember walking off that stage and that smell, you know, that smell of a stage that you get and, and the wings. And my official job was assistant stage manager. But, you know, I didn't really want to do that because that was, I wanted, I wanted, all I wanted was the nighttime gig, you know, in, introducing, you know, club acts of the year and comedians that have been on the TV show, comedians. It was really, really exciting. And I, I loved I loved being on that stage and being out front and, and comparing that. And I suppose, you know, from there, when I when I left there and, and went into nightclubs, um, that, that stayed with me because, you know, you were you were centre stage, you were playing the music, entertaining the crowd. And for me, I always wanted to play an instrument, but I was never any good at it. So DJing was the next best thing, you know, spinning the music and watching the crowd react. You know, and I love that. I love doing that. Uh, and it's interesting that because do you think the fact on the musical instrument side, because I can relate to that. Do you think, is there an element of wanting to play an instrument, but not being not, is it about not having the patience to learn it? Would, would, is it a case of saying, oh, yeah, I want to learn it, but I want to be I want to have it injected into my brain in in a week and then I can just go out and become, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's what I was like. And that's how I'm like, I, you know, I like, I like the idea of playing musical instruments, but I know I haven't got the patience or the attention span. Yeah. So when synthesizers came out. Back in the eight, early 80s, I was thought I'd died and gone to heaven because all of a sudden, you know, I have these keyboards. I could press, make sounds and actually make music without yeah. spending 43 hours a week with me hands bleeding from trying to strum a guitar, you know. Yeah, I mean, I can relate to. I can relate to that. And I, I'd probably take it a step further and say I'm quite lazy. The fact that <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't be bothered. I just want it now. I'm, a, yeah, I'm yeah. an immediate yeah. sort of guy. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's probably why radio worked for me every day as well later on, because the immediacy of it. Um, but but the, the, the thrill of playing great tunes in big clubs. I mean, I, I DJed in clubs in, 
uh, for a company called Madison, who had clubs in in Newcastle and and Leeds and and Nottingham, where I was for a couple of years. And and during that time, so I, I was playing at Madison to a thousand people on a Saturday night. Then I get a a little bit of paper saying, you know, the raves on at the Nottingham railway sheds at, at three a.m. Because of course, before mobile phones, I get a little message. So you get your best twenty. 12 inches in a bag, get down there, you know, and tr try and play some music to a crowd between 3 and 5 a.m. Uh, illegally uh, until the Rosas turned up, you know, and you'd be running with your best 12 inches, you know, <laughs> down, down the road trying to evade. But, the, you know, the joy of playing that music and watching the crowd just go. I remember playing at a, a club in, in Nottingham that is a new club called the Black Orchid, which was out near Showcase Cinemas. And that was that was 2,000 capacity. And I, I remember playing the student night on a Monday night, you know, 2,000 students, you know, and playing Don't Let Me Down Gently by the Wonder Stuff. And the whole dance floor was going like this. And I'm, I'm stood there thinking, how did a little boy from South Yorkshire get here? You know, I'm in total control. And then I dumped the lights off. And I, I remember seeing the manager running across the balcony, absolutely bricking it, running across, thinking, oh, it's all gone, it's all gone off. And then I just clicked on the spotlight and played the Hamlet tune and had a little cigarette going in there. Doom, doom, doom. And 2,000 people just, you know, in the palm of your hand. It's, so it's, it's an amazing remarkable. thing. Really. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was a remarkable thing. So how did you then move into broadcasting? Was that, again, was that an accident or was that a... a a dream or a, a goal? How, how did that come about? Well, I, I, I'd, I'd been doing hospital radio um, when I was in Bridlington. So it was always, it was always a passion of mine to, to do radio. And I always thought, you know, this, this ability to entertain, and I'm not being big headed when I say, you know, I do have this thing where I, I can make people smile. And uh, I've always felt it, even at school. And I've always felt the need to do it as well, and have an audience in front of me. So I, I always thought I could, you know, work well on radio if I could just, you know, learn word economy a little bit uh, and not talk so much. So it was interesting because I, I moved to Peterborough. I was made an offer to come and, and DJ in Peterborough, a nightclub in Peterborough. I, I'd never been. I didn't know where Peterborough was. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew it was off the A1 somewhere close to Nottingham, which was a proper city, obviously. And uh, I remember coming to Peterborough on a Tuesday night and they were putting the chairs on the tables at half eight, you know, packing up in the bars. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? You know, but it, I saw the nightclub and I saw the people uh, and I came to Peterborough. And then I spent a year um, constantly ringing the program controller at Harrowwood FM saying I could, I could be good. Uh, you know, I'll be great. I could get, and it, I'm not kidding. It was a year, and he got so fed up with me. He gave me a Friday night dance show after a year, where I just played dance music. And then after about three months, uh, you know, because I, I've always been into preparation. I, I, I call I'm a bit of a contradiction. So I said I'm lazy, but I do prepare, and I think that's really important in everything that you do, whether it's nightclub work listening to 12 inches or whatever, listening to your music beforehand or radio where you prep for at least an hour, two hours before you go out. So you know what you're going to talk about. Um, and I was, I was prepping three hours early for a dance show and the guy on drive time never turned up. So he looked around, you can do it. And it was the day it was radio with carts. Do you remember the, the carts that used to shove in machines? So you got all the adverts. And it was a three-way split over three stations. So my first gig in radio was a drive time show. And I had a bit of help from a guy I knew what he was doing. And it was across three different stations with adverts finishing all at different times. And I remember getting all the adverts in and all the fillers and everything and sorting it out and getting it right. And then the guy behind me says, you've not put the next CD in. <laughs> with the next thing, not thinking about anything I was going to say, just getting the adverts and the music on. So, yeah, it was a bit of a baptism of fire, but yeah, I loved it. And I was never off the radio um, after that day for uh, until I started working in TV, really. So, I think what, what's, what's fascinating for me about that is the element where you said about it took you a year. And it's what I sometimes call with my clients about the persistence test. Hmm. And that links very much to the passion, doesn't it? You know, you had such a passion to be on that radio. You weren't going to take no for an answer. And no. I often think that we live in an age, as, you, as we mentioned a minute ago, where everything's about instant gratification. And people, if people don't get the instant gratification, they lose interest or they can't be bothered or they think, oh, it's, it's pointless. I'm not going to get there. I'm not going to get. 
But what's interesting for me about that is you had that persistence to keep going. And I think anybody watching this, and I, you know, we've tried to make passions about what we call ideas, insights, and inspiration. And I think if anybody watching this, or even anybody watching this with kids, should probably just play that clip of, of what can happen if you're persistent and you keep going and don't just give up. Well, I think I think it's important to have that, and I think you're right in what you're saying. And I try and instill it in my daughter because I, I think I, I think the passion comes from wanting to show off, but it also comes from um, having a, quite a poor background. You know, I grew up in pit villages and houses that you know, if people lived in them today, they'd be condemned. You know, we had no carpets and all that sort of stuff, and my family had no money. You know, we used to go to the butchers and ask him for a some bones for the dog and then my dad will make stew out of it you know and i'm not kidding you know this this was how we lived um but that's at the back of your mind all the time and i think it, it, it's still there now with me even though i've had quite a successful career i still think oh what if we end up skint again uh, so that that drives you i think a little bit as well as the need to show off so that the year i spent thinking you know i can do radio that's another place i could show off um <laughs> and you know when, when that day came i was so busy you know living it and doing it that I, I never sort of took a step back to think oh how did i do that how did i get here uh but i did and then f from heroin i i um they were taken over then by a company that just brought in little cards um i think gwr i think they were called um they, you, you must say that every link and i thought hmm, that's not me you know that's not how you make people smile and entertain them so then i applied to be a sports producer at bbc radio cambridgeshire so that's how my, my journey in the bbc started um with with very little experience i bluffed my way into the bbc i mean i, I didn't they were talking about vps and this and that i, I don't know what they're talking about uh i didn't know it was a voice piece i didn't know what a voice piece was i didn't know how to type i didn't know what q was uh, but I just managed to bluff my way in and learn on the job, which was which was tough. But um, you know, some very good people taught me some very good things in my early days in the BBC, which you know, a lot of them stand me in good stead today. Yeah, I think that's that, that again is very interesting because um, I know a lot of people, and if, I suppose if I'm honest, I can include myself in this. Um, but I, I know a lot of people who um, have got a certain belief that they can learn fast enough to be able to bluff their way into a, a situation or bluff their way into an opportunity, but know that they can learn fast enough to be able mm. to succeed in that opportunity, even though perhaps the CV doesn't necessarily tick all the right boxes. Yeah, I think it's, um, more, I think it's more difficult to bluff your way in these days, I think, and in yeah. particular the BBC, and I think it's, it's a... <sighs> I think the BBC needs more working class people and that's very difficult because, you know, somebody like me with two O levels bluff their way in. I don't think you can do that now. I think that there's far too much reliance on have you been to university, have you got a degree? But then I think that did, for some for some elements of the BBC, it detaches them from their listeners or their viewers. Uh, and I think your, your staff have need to replicate your listeners to some extent. Do you know what I mean? So I think they, they need to open up avenues to people, you know, oiks like me uh, that, that can that can get in the BBC, because I, I think it's it makes it a richer place uh, and a better place and more representative of the people that they're broadcasting to. Uh, and I, I always, always felt they and. You know, I have a lot to be thankful to the BBC for, certainly. But I always felt like an outsider. I always felt like the guy that had bluffed his way in and didn't really, did I, do I deserve to be here? Do I? What am I doing here? You know, why am I, I'm reading the Telegraph, they're all reading the Guardian, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so I, 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 I can so relate to that. I can so relate to that as well, actually. Um, being a Northern lad, you know, Manchester lad, I can remember, and I think I mentioned to you when we spoke on the phone before the interview, um, you know, I'm from Manchester, but I was in Peterborough, and I think I mentioned to you around the mm. time you were DJing, so I probably danced to one of your tunes, which is really yeah. weird. You um, and Spencer Phillips, of course. Me and Spencer, yes, exactly. He was exactly. a terrible dancer, Spencer. <laughs> exactly. I can't believe that, actually. It's weird, because uh, it's not exactly the centre of the universe, but it was because, as I can mention, I was with Thomas Cooks, and their head office mm. was there, so that was that was it. Um, and I completely lost my drift now, but, um, outside you were talking about being outside. Yes. Out, yes, that's right. Mm. And, and I, I got into 
what you might call senior management, I suppose. And I can remember being with two guys who were more senior than me, who were on the, and I was on the train with them. And they were very much, uh, you know, two Thomas Cook guys, very much, um, oh, yes, okay, yes, uh, John, we really need to sort, you know, reading the finance, and I'm not exaggerating, reading the Financial Times. And I can remember thinking, every time I open my, and it's awful to say it, but I thought, every time I open my mouth, I feel like a northern oik. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just because it's awful I, situation. I left Radio Cambridge for a job at Five Life in the yeah. sports room, uh, which I was, well, I, I just couldn't believe I got the job. I remember walking down Regent Street to the the old broadcasting house. I remember walking up there with a skip in my step thinking, little lad from South Yorkshire, I've got two O-levels. I'm off to work at Five Life. I'm going into broadcasting house. And it was very old and archaic then. I mean, it's had that huge refurb and refit now, but the windows didn't close and it was cold. And there was one escalator that you went up in. And then you went to the old bit of the building where the sports room was. And I remember um, walking in there for the first day and whew, I did feel like an outsider then. And I, I did have the Daily Telegraph under my arm. And I walked past Cornelius Lyser, the racing correspondent, and Mark Pugach was there, Nick Mullins, um, and all these you know great names. Uh, John Inverdell uh, was was on air, and um, Peter Allen and Jane Garvey were doing drive time. And you know, I I, ju- I really then felt, oh my god, you know, who am I? What am I? You know, I'm just a, a bit of a pleb. Uh, in the mix of of these these amazing people, and I remember, you know, being nervous and feeling nervous. And I remember Cornelius Lysa, His first words to me were an expletive, uh, which was a test, and one which I passed. Uh, I remember Pat Murphy testing me as well on cricket, you know. And I said, "Well, hold on a minute, I, you know, I played quite. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to cricket, Pat. I played for Yorkshire. And I played for York, you know, Yorkshire Colts." You know, I was a decent, decent cricketer in my youth. Um, I said, I know what I'm talking about. You know, so you you, you, ha- you sank or swim in that, in that environment. And uh, I swam, you know, and I, I, I had a couple of years in, in Five Live working with all these amazing people. Uh, but I still felt, I still felt like, you know, they'd all been to university, you know, and there's me, you know, I went to Gold Grammar, you know. I, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but it's come up a lot on this show. And it, this whole journey, this whole research, exploration and passions and everything, all sorts of things come up and you start to see certain patterns emerging. And I don't know if you've come across the term imposter syndrome. Yeah. In yeah, travel. Have, yeah. yeah. Um, that's amazing how often that comes up. And the majority of people, vast majority of people that, that I'm interviewing and will be interviewing are accomplished in what they do. You know, it's not all about billionaires or millionaires, but they're accomplished and, and relatively fulfilled in their careers. And yet it comes up time and time again, <laughs> this little voice in their head that says, what the hell are you doing? This isn't where you belong. Get back where you belong. And it, it's it's amazing yeah. how often and it comes it, up. And, but it drives you as well. And and I, th- I think it, 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 it provides that fight that you need. I, I always... I always felt like I had to fight to get where I needed to be. Mm. And, I, mm. and I, I don't mean other people's journeys were, were less tortuous, but I think, you know, some seemed to breeze into careers and, you know, and it was all smooth. I remember, I remember talking to Simon Mann, who, who's part of the Test Match Special Cricket team now. We were on a tube and uh, he lived five minutes from, from Broadcasting House. And he said, he said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going home to Peterborough. He said, well, you're commuting here and there what, every day. I said, yeah, every day. He said, well, just moved to London. I said, well, I, I, a flat in London's like 300 grand. I said, I, I can't afford to live here. He said, oh, well, you know, just ask your dad. I said, well, no, no, my dad's not minted. You know, I, I, you know, he lives in a, a flat in Bridlington. What? And, and they, they couldn't grasp you know, maybe some of the sacrifices that, that I made and, and some of the others made, and people like David Croft, who's now um, motor racing commentator for Sky, you know, I started at Five Live at the same time as him. 
Uh, and he made a lot of sacrifices, and that's why I doff my cap to David, and I stay in touch with him um, quite a bit as well. But he he fought, he fought to get where he is today because he was sort of you know he was sidelined as the darts correspondent, you know, and that was like mm, over there, David. But you know he he fought and fought, and he's got where he deserves to be. So I think there is something in that the imposter syndrome. And me and David both shared it, I think, and we, we spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, but we both kept fighting. And and as as I worked for Five Live, I then morphed into um, the TV um, side of things as well. Um, one, once uh, BBC Sports started their own sort of TV uh, TV output, which is on a, a channel called BBC Choice, uh, which was <laughs> which was there before the BBC News Channel. We used to have a daily sports program presented by Matt Smith, who used to sit on the edge of a desk because we had no facilities, um, but we had money. So, yeah, so... all these people you mentioned, I, I know these names. Being a, a little bit older, and mm. all these names you mentioned, I recognise, and particularly more recently, um, I am a bit of an F1 fanboy uh, these days. I don't quite know where that came from, but I am. Mm. Uh, so David Croft or Crofty, I listen to him a lot. I watch him a lot, obviously, because he's on Sky now, isn't he? On Sky, he is. He's easily commentator. Yeah, but he was yeah, very absolutely. insecure. We we both suffered from this sort of insecurity because we we were both from humble backgrounds and both fought our way up so we, we'd sit there on a night you know in the sports room waiting to you know do the ten thirty bulletin putting it together and we'd be having these chats about you know whether we fit in or we did fit in how hard we'd have to fight and uh, so we we related and i i went off to tv to do uh, to be a sports correspondent um which again i, I you know it, i just sort of fell into that really because I was quite happy doing radio. And then the guy in charge said, look, we're setting up this TV operation. We think you'd be great. Uh, I said, well, okay, well, what do I do? And so I went on a couple of courses and all of a sudden I was going to football grounds all around the country, all around the world, traveling the world um, at the Sydney Olympics. You know, I was the main guy, you know, walking up the tower, 100 foot up to, to do pieces to camera. Uh, and it was remarkable, you know, to, to have that, that sort of journey um so, and so still be so, sorry so sorry to interrupt you but so tv wasn't something that was on your radar in there because you said you went into radio as if it was like that was the option that was the one you wanted to do hmm. which is interesting because i think i think nowadays i would say and, and challenge me on this but nowadays i'd say everybody wants to be a flipping tv star <laughs> everybody <laughs> wants to be on on a presenter is the classic isn't it but was but you were drawn more to radio than TV. Is that the case? And why was that? If, if I got, that I, right? I think I was I was drawn to radio because um, I listened to it a lot when I was a kid. I listened to No Lebman. He was my Radio One Breakfast Show DJ. No Lebman's, you know, the prank calls, the fun, again, the showing off, the entertainment. Uh, and I always thought I think I could probably do that. And I, I I could probably entertain people on the radio. And I love the radio. I love the immediacy of it. I love the text coming in, the phone calls coming in, uh, and I never thought of TV really and until that point. And and again, you're that little boy. I'm a little boy from South Yorkshire with two O levels. I can't be on TV. You know, that imposter syndrome is there. It's really. So that's what held you back from television in a sense. It was. Well, radio I never thought of it. Yeah. Maybe subconsciously, even. Yeah, yeah, maybe. You know, radio was my level. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 Amazing. to be honest, to be honest, when when the the head of of sport at the time said, "Look, we've got this money, and we're, we're going to start doing TV sport," and I said, "Oh, brilliant!" and he said, "We want you to be one of the the correspondents," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." Uh, again, you know, you you think, "What? Well, you chuck him in at the deep end?" I've got to learn all this stuff, but I did, and I learned it all, and. You know, walking into press conferences with Alex Ferguson and people like that and, uh, you know, sitting next to Henry Winter and, and great journalists and asking questions in press conferences, you know, to start with, you think, oh, my word, you know, uh, but then it becomes second nature and you know what you're doing. And within a short time, you're, you're producing you know, good films and you're going to these amazing places uh, and you're walking into you know, Premier League football clubs or the Bernabeu or wherever it may be or, or cricket stadiums or, and, and you're reporting from, from Olympics in no time at all. And I, I, remember, I remember when I got to Sydney, I think that was probably the, the most I've ever sort of had to stop and pinch myself because I went out to the Sydney Olympics sort of two weeks 
before everybody to do the preview films and all that sort of stuff. And I remember walking into the International Broadcast Centre, which is a huge, huge building where all the TV outlets are. And I remember just looking to my left and thinking, wow, there's every TV channel in the world in this place. There's um, a cafeteria the size of about 10 McDonald's, you know. There's all these amazing broadcasters. And there's little old Paul Stanton from Ghoul. Ghoul Grammar, you know, two <laughs> levels. And here I yeah. am. Yeah, I, I was interviewing um, Giles Cooper, from uh, who's the chairman of the Royal Variety Charity. Mm. Uh, and I said to him, was there, was there ever a moment you thought, how did this happen? And he said, yes, I can remember exactly when it was. And he, he was with the Queen and Prince Charles in the Royal Box. And, and, it, and it seems that a lot of people do do that, you know, at different levels, of course, in different ways. I suppose it's a bit like I remember my very first company car. It sounds mighty, but I remember getting in the car and thinking, I've got a company car. And I thought it was absolutely amazing. You know, mm. and, and I think there are those what I often call wow moments throughout life where you go, wow. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and I, I remember it's, it's similar to pulling on that BBC jacket with the BBC mm. logo on it, you know, and getting that for the first time. And, and the power that gives you, because, you know, I, I remember I, I interviewed David Beckham quite a, a number of times and we were following a Champions League game. It's Manchester United uh, versus Olympiacos in um, Athens. And if you've not got the rights to um, a Champions League game, ITV had the rights at the time, you, you then have to stand in a long line of broadcasters with your camera, hoping people are going to stop, footballers and managers, because they don't have to. Um, and on this particular occasion, I don't know if you remember the golden balls thing when um, yeah, Victoria... So they because that's the other thing we, we used to do in the afternoon on Five Live. We'd read the sport into Chris Moyles because Chris Moyles used to do an, an evening show. So we'd we'd read sport into Chris Moyles. Um, then we'd read sport into um, Steve Wright in the afternoon on Radio 2. So you had to have a different style for every one uh, and adapt uh, to do that. And Chris Moyles had been talking about it to Victoria Beckham and she said, oh, yeah, you know, David often wears me knickers. Uh, and so... At this point, I'm working in TV, and, and my producers on the phone say, "Yeah, this has just happened. Um, can you can you talk to David Beckham about it?" I said, "Well, I'm in the bowels of Olympiacos Stadium at the minute. It's an hour after the game's finished, and he's talking to MUTV, and he's been talking to him for ten minutes. So there's 15 cameras ahead of me." I said, "I will try my best," but the BBC jacket. As he walks down, I step out and I go, "David, BBC," and the power of that stopped him in his tracks and I, because i knew him as well I, i'd interviewed him a few times i said is there any chance we just have two minutes and of course he yeah all right yeah yeah all right yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and i said the first question straight in nothing about the game i said victoria's been on chris Moore saying that you wear you wear her knickers and calling I, I you he stopped at that point <laughs> he dropped, but he was brilliant because he, he went oh no what's she been doing now and then he went on to talk about it for a sort of minute or so and, and we we got the audio of that which sort of went viral before viral was a thing and we got that sent back to london that night and um yeah in, in, a, sense, in a sense that shows in in i suppose in business terms that shows the power of brand doesn't it mm. yeah yeah flash yeah. the logo and yeah, and that jacket that jacket came in very very handy down the years. But uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a good time. Yeah, I think you're going to have to write some book a book or memoirs if you haven't done already. I'm sure there's a I'm sure there's a book in there already based on what you've just told us. Well, my wife my wife says that to me. You should write a book. I think who would read it? You know, I'm not, I'm I'm one of these people that you know I've done all these things, but you know I'm not particularly famous. You know, I, I suppose where I live, there's a few thousand people for me on social media, or whatever. Um, but you know. Who would who would read it? I don't know. Maybe there is maybe there is a book there. Maybe. Well, but again, I'm people, quite lazy. I'd need somebody to write it for me. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, that's obviously absolutely fine. That's that's perfectly normal. Um, I, I don't know if it helps, but I I put together a book. I did it with somebody else, um, mm. a business book. Um, you know, great cure for insomnia. But for pe and this is the interesting <laughs> thing for people who have got small businesses who are desperate to survive and grow them. You know, it's it was a decent. I've got a copy here about with me, but it's a decent size, you know, that kind of thickness mm, and mm. Um, covered all sorts of various different things, but you know, not, not sparkly, sexy stuff, just 
business growth and business development and all the rest of it. But it was amazing when I wrote that book because I was doing and I still am doing speech and speaking engagements. Published author, suddenly my my fees for those speeches went up double. Nice. <laughs> and it, so, so I always say to people, people say, can, "Can I get hold of the book?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I might have some. Can I buy the book?" And I say, "Well, I might have it somewhere." But in all honesty, it was the strategic value of it mm. that was more mm. important. You it's know, interesting so as well. Like, yeah, I, yeah, I think I think the in terms of my story and and where I came from and, and where I ended up and where I am now, um, I think it it does inspire. I mean, I often do talks at local schools and things like that, and I say to kids, you know, do your best, get an education, but don't worry if you don't get everything you want because as long as you've got a bit of drive and a bit of passion passion um you oh. can you can do amazing things you know this is this is my story i got from here to here and some of it was a bit of luck some of it was being in the right place at the right time but without the drive and the passion and the fight none of it would have happened i could have done what most of the kids who went to Gould grammar school did and go work at hygiene i could have done that i could have just settled for that you know, and I'm not saying that's wrong or right, but it wasn't for me because I need, <laughs> I needed somewhere to show off. <laughs> and I yeah. found many, many outlets for it. Yeah, I met yeah. some great people along the way, you know, yeah. like Spencer and, and many others, Crofty and other people. And now me, of course. And you, of course, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> yes, of course. I thought course. I'd just throw that one in. Yeah. Um, no, it's absolutely amazing. And, and, um, and I think it's really important, this, actually, uh, as a conversation, because... Uh, you know, I do tend to think that um, education can be a bit sheep dip. I do think that it's almost like we need to dip you in all the different things. And very, yeah, very and I early think on, I, I think, think that's a mistake. You know what I, mean? I, I, I look at education in a different way now. And I think, you know, how good would it have been if I'd gone to a school that that focused on the arts, you know, and, and entertainment and that sort of thing? And, and I know it's difficult because you want all kids to have a, a basic education. But I think some kids just don't don't get school they don't get the lessons i didn't you know i, I loved english uh, i love mucking about i love drama all that sort of stuff um and my daughter's slightly similar she she's a she's a uh, she's got that natural comedy thing about her you know she she likes to laugh and play jokes and muck about um and i think some kids do and i think some kids are practical some kids are um edu you know into education and i, I think the, the one size fits all, I don't think it quite works, you know, and I think you waste a lot of time when you could be doing other things, but, you know. I, I, don't, I don't think it does, and, you know, mm. I don't want to get on a soapbox, but by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't think it, I don't think it does. If you look at the, the um, and I'm not an expert in this, loads of people can challenge me on it, but <laughs> if you look at the way in which education works, at the heart of it, education seems to me to work in exactly the same way, in a sense, that it did when people were being, ready to go into factories mm, yeah. years ago yeah it is a similar thing and and i think i probably held people back at school because i was mucking about all the time so it would have been better if all the mucking about kids had been in one place and the studious kids have been in another and the kids who wanted to you know bang bits of tin with a hammer were somewhere else uh, I think that that would have been a, a a better way for me to to enjoy school and probably for most of the kids that were in my class that have got more done, you know. <laughs> like I, I, just, I just wish mm. that they would be able to spend a bit more time in identifying what people's, what kids' passions are or what they might mm. be even and double down on the strengths that they've got rather than trying to give them more education in the weaknesses. And then the other thing is, and I'm going to, I'm not, a, by the way, I'm not, an, I don't write about education or do podcasts about education. It's having two kids myself. It's something I've thought about. And I just wish that there'd be more around, um, you know, identifying these strengths and making more of those strengths, because I think mm. that they'd be more engaged if they were spending more time on things they were interested in. I mean, you, you I obviously need all true. the basics. Yeah. The of course you do. But yeah, I think, I think looking back over my life, I, I think, you know, the BBC taught me far more than I ever learned at school. And I, I have, I, I use in, in my career now, which is, you know, running a, a PR and communications company, PS Media, I, I use a lot of the things the BBC taught me in reverse, you know, when I'm media training chief executives uh, or spokespeople, as I am doing at the minute with one high profile person, you know, I'm, I'm using those skills that 
that the BBC taught me, um, I'm not necessarily using a lot that I learned at school. You know, obviously the basics are there, the English and, and um, the, the maths and, and, and all that sort of thing. But I, I, pro I think life has taught me far more you know, than I ever learned at school. So, well, what, what do you think of the state of the media now? Then, because obviously it's a very different place. You mentioned, um, I think you mentioned about that you do podcasts now as well. But, you know, impact of podcasts on radio. Um, what do you think the state of media is now in relative terms to? Well, how it's been? I, I left. I left my TV correspondence job in 2006, 2007, um, mainly because um, I had a daughter and I wasn't seeing her very much. <laughs> and I wanted to see her grow up um, and I wouldn't have seen her because I was traveling all over the place. So uh, quite a few eyebrows were raised when I, I left my TV job because it was a good job. Uh, but I, I then went back into BBC local radio. So I went backwards, if you like, um, and, you know, spent, 10 years doing breakfast shows and mid morning shows and really, really enjoying, you know, what we were doing, winning awards, Gillard awards, local radio awards, um, and entertaining people and building audiences. And uh, I was really, really, you know, loving being back in local radio and the immediacy of it. And for the first sort of, you know, seven or eight years, it, it, it was brilliant. But I, I, I think that, the radio landscape has changed again dramatically with all these these stations buying up the individual stations so your global mm -hmm. hours and i i see beige radio now and it really distresses me you know i i like to open a microphone and make a difference make somebody cry make them laugh entertain them tell them something they need to know that for me is radio engaging radio and and the best the best compliments I've ever had from people, and this is this is people in power who I've held to account, is that they've stayed in the car for an extra five minutes while I've been interviewing somebody because they wanted to hear the end. You know, for me, that's that's what radio should be about. It's like when I used to listen to Steve Wright as a kid, I was listening for the bits in between the songs. You know, who's mad? I'll tell you who's mad. You know, all that sort of stuff, Mr. Angry. You know, and I know it was ripped off a lot of it from Howard Stern, but it was our rip off. And it, it was it was creating memorable spaces in between the records. And I don't hear that. I, I hear Dave, Dave Barry doing it a bit. Um, Christian O'Connell did before he left for Australia. I listened to, to radio and BBC Local Radio, um, Bauer Radio, Global Radio. It's all very beige. It's all very samey and nothing really stands out for me. I really struggle with radio and I listen to a lot of podcasts now and I listen to my own music because there isn't a Steve Wright. You know, there's a Dave Barry and that's about it for me. Yeah. I guess the, the benefit of podcasts now is that a lot more people can do it or all the technology is available pretty much to anybody mm. and everybody. And I guess where the benefit of that is, as far as I can see, is the fact you can, there's a lot more ability to access niche stuff. So if you're particularly, we were talking just before we came on air about cameras and stuff. If you want to actually know about and understand and enjoy camera technology or the different types of ca microphones or whatever. You're such a geek. You're laughing and smiling as you're saying it, aren't you? I know. I know. It's ridiculous. It's. it's I don't know where this has come from. <laughs> Maybe I need to interview myself at some point about my yeah, passion. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, but there is a lot more opportunity to access niche content yeah. in its purest form rather than wait for it to come along. Well, I think it's an opportunity for people to have a voice. And, I, I, you know, that's that worries me on one aspect anyway, because I, I think there's a lot of polarisation going on with uh, Twitter and, and, and Facebook, and, and we see it in America. It's, it's creating, it's not creating a conversation. It's creating two polarised camps where never the twain shall meet. And, you know, part of that is that the way the news is delivered to each camp by Facebook and by Twitter and telling them what they want to hear. And it, what radio should be about and what, what social media should be about for me is about a conversation where people that disagree come together and allow each other to have an opinion. Whereas at the minute it's like, I'm right. No, I'm right. And I'm not talking to you about it because I'm right. 
and Facebook says I'm right. And well, no, it doesn't because I've had different news to you today because they've filtered it and I'm right. So it's a really dangerous place. So I think in, in terms of podcasts, that's good because people can have, have access to them very simply, very easily, just on a phone or whatever. You can create a podcast uh, and you can, you can have your say, but equally that there needs to be a filter of what is true. And, you know, when, when it, People knock the BBC, but at least it's a filter. At least it is a, a place where you can get filtered news and you know you're getting the truth or pretty darn close to the truth because I know the way they work and I know I can trust that news and I know I can trust the journalism. Uh, in terms of, part, you know, the podcast we make, um, I make it with a – it's called the Total BS Podcast because my name is Stainton and his is Barber. And also, obviously, play on the word BS. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, we, we just take, you know, 10, 10 stories of the week and we just rip into them, you know, and we, we try and take the mickey and entertain and, and, again, show off on the podcast and make people smile. And uh, hopefully we do. Yeah, we don't need to do a lot. We just need to play clips of Gavin Williamson uh, and Boris Johnson, basically. <laughs> uh, that's all we did this yeah, week. Let's, let's not go down the political <laughs> rabbit hole. We're going to go for another hour and a half. No, and no, no. For, as, no, yeah, no, no. As, as for COVID, let's not go there either. Um, but, you know, that's brilliant, Paul. Thanks ever so much for that. Um, I think there's just so many takeaways from that, just in terms of general... Um, success and achievement and fulfillment in life and work, not to mention the the stories and the, the fun elements of it. I've certainly really, really enjoyed it. Um, how do people find out more than about you and PS Media? Have you got a website? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you can go to, if, if you're up for a bit of uh, media training or, or you need some videos making or, or some, some comms, um, then just go to psmedia.org.uk. And, you know, just have a look on YouTube. You can see some of the stuff I've done, some of the films I've made. Uh, I think there's a few old BBC films on there as well. Me at the Grand National. Uh, me with, uh, with doing a piece to camera with my back to Colin McRae coming down a hill at 40 miles an hour in Wales. That's, that's a tricky task. Back to the – and you can hear it coming and it's loud. Do you know what I mean? I, I believe that's on online somewhere as well. But, yeah, I, I mean, I've had a great career. I've had a varied career. I've loved – every bit of it from DJing to the stage to TV and I'm enjoying something different now and and that's I think that's the key for me I have to keep it different and I have to keep doing different things that um, allow me to show off and have fun and uh, I've certainly done that in in my career variety that, that yeah that's what I, yeah. I, I you and I are obviously very similar in that I get bored really easy oh, and yeah. uh, I have to be doing new projects new things and what I always find is that when you do interesting thing in, interesting things interesting things happen actually they do I, I think that that is very very true somebody said to me a couple of years ago oh you should be a director of communications for a council or this or that I said I couldn't do that I couldn't do that every day I said I'm coming and help you I'll do a day and I'll give you my expert opinion. I'll look over your top lines and your key messages and all that malarkey. I'll make you a video, uh, but I'm, a, I'm not doing nine to five, five days a week, you know, talk, <laughs> you know, dealing with these idiots, you know, no, 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 because I might want to do something else on Friday, like a podcast or something, you know, whatever mood I'm in. Uh, and that's the beauty of it. I, I think to be able to um, be in a position, I'm fortunate, obviously, you know, what I've done in my life allows me to be in a position where I can almost pick and choose, you know, what I do and I don't have to be bored and my short attention span can be catered for and my need for showing off uh, can, be, can be can be satisfied. Well, I always uh, say one of the most important things for us all is self-awareness. Mm. And if we've got self-awareness and you clearly have bags of it, if you've got self-awareness, you know you like showing off. Um, it's not very British, so you have to fight it, of course. Mm. Um, but I think it's great that you've accepted that. You know yourself, you know what you enjoy, you know what you're about, and you go on the journey based on that. And I just think that's fantastic. So, Well, thank you. Paul, it's been a joy to talk to you, Phil. Thank you. It's been a joy to talk to you as well. And thanks ever so much for joining me. I really appreciate it because I know, you know, at the end of the day, time's precious. And uh, thanks for joining me today, Paul, on Passions. Thank you. Bye-bye.